Shall we go for it? Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our talk on the importance of empathy during Mental Health Week. I'm Victoria Ewan and I'm a clinical psychology doctoral intern here at Sullivan and Associates Clinical Psychology. Hey everybody, I'm Nicole Stewart. I'm the manager of training, education, justice, housing, and case management over at the Canadian Mental Health Association. She's got a lot of roles. Yeah, I've got a few hats right now. <laughs> There we go. Um, we're happy to have you all here today. Um, you'll see here a quote about empathy and how it's a universal solvent. If you remember from early biology class, that means that it helps break things down. We hope that throughout the presentation you will learn a bit about empathy and how it can be developed and used to create connections with others and how being more empathetic can improve our lives and our communities. The quote is by Simon Colgan, a British clinical psychologist, professor, researcher, and author of the book Zero Degrees of Empathy. You will see another quote. All right, so here we have the outline, uh, outline of what we plan to cover today. Um, although feel free to ask questions about anything else related to empathy if I didn't discuss it. Um, first, we're going to go through some definitions of empathy, and as you'll see, there's a lot of them. Then we'll talk about what behaviors that are associated with empathy. Uh, from there, we're going to discuss how empathy and mental health are related. And then we'll share some strategies to improve your own level of empathy and encourage empathy in those around you. So at the end, we'll leave some time for questions. Although again, free, feel free to ask as we go along. A quick Google search turns up the definition of empathy from the Oxford languages. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. The word empathy was coined in the very early 1900s by psychologist Edward Richener. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I noticed the question, I think, is what we're probably pointing out. Cool. Uh, will there be a replay available? And usually there is. So the translation of the German term Entfühlung. <laughs> We looked it up beforehand. Yes, We're I still not sure. <laughs> I still ruined it, um, which means feeling into. While this definition makes the idea of empathy sound very straightforward, it's actually much more complicated than it appears on the surface. So I looked at the literature on empathy, and it's pretty all over the place as to exactly what empathy means. Different authors and different researchers look at it in different ways. So I have a few of them here, but know that there's probably plenty more that I don't touch on. So the first box you'll see, it says dispositional and situational empathy. So kind of like anxiety or personality traits, like extroversion, uh, people have different baseline levels. So what you know, have, we're naturally disposed to. And then the levels vary based on the context that the person is in as well. So this is the case with empathy. Um, where some people are just naturally more empathetic and doesn't matter what the situation is. Uh, that's called dispositional or trait empathy. Then depending on the situation, a person might be more or less likely to be empathetic, uh, regardless of what their baseline levels are. And this is context dependent or situational empathy. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. In the second box, you'll see that psychological researchers often break down empathy into three parts. That's the kind of the components of psychology in a nutshell. So there's emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and compassionate or behavioral empathy. Uh, emotional empathy refers to whether or not you can feel what the other person is feeling. Cognitive empathy is whether or not you can logically understand the other person's thoughts and feelings. And then compassionate or behavioral empathy so that's whether or not you actually act on your awareness of the other person's thoughts and feelings. So do you try to comfort them or help them in some way because you know how they feel? So that's the three components of empathy, according to the researchers. And then the final box, you'll see it talks about how empathy can be automatic or intentional. So if you're like me, sometimes you find yourself watching a movie or a TV show and you get really absorbed in the characters and you start to feel what they feel. I always give the example of Seinfeld. I'm not sure why, but the, the characters just do embarrassing things and I can barely watch it because I'm constantly feeling embarrassed on behalf of the characters and I can't really laugh at them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one show that I just, my level of empathy is, it makes me uncomfortable. 
Uh, I've heard the same thing said about New Girl. She just does embarrassing things and people can't handle it because they, they empathize a little too much. It happens automatically. Uh, intentional empathy is when you try very hard to understand someone's perspective. Uh, often because the understanding isn't happening automatically. It's a little bit harder. So we're motivated to understand. There's a video called Empathy versus Sympathy by Brene Brown that you will see in the resources at the end of this presentation, and it discusses how empathy can be broken down into several processes. These include perspective taking. This is the ability to see another person's perspective and understand the world through their eyes. Avoiding judgment, which just is just like it sounds, involves withholding negative assumptions about the other person and their perspective. Also being able to correctly identify emotions in others. We rely a lot on the different cues to determine how a person is feeling, including their body language, their facial expression, tone, language. Some people are very good at reading others' emotions and, and others really struggle with this. This has been labeled as empathetic accuracy in the literature. When you try to feel what another person is feeling, how good are you at actually determining what that person is feeling? This plays a large role in how empathetic a person is. Finally, communicating that awareness. Being able to share what you understand about how the other person is feeling and thinking is effective and a meaningful way. Taking a process-orientated look at empathy helps us to understand exactly what it takes to engage empathetically with another person. So now we're going to talk a little bit about brain science. So neuroscientists have looked at some of the structures in the brain that are involved in the experience of empathy, and they found different brain regions are more highly activated when someone is engaging in empathy. And I won't go into all the details because it's a lot of information, but I found the key kind of brain area that I wanted to highlight is a specific type of neuron or brain cell that's at least partly responsible for the experience of empathy, and it's called a mirror neuron. And what they found is that if we're watching someone do something, these mirror neurons will activate in the same way as if we were doing it. And they originally studied it in monkeys. Uh, so you'll see some pictures here of monkeys grabbing a banana. Um, and you can see how just watching the monkey grab the banana will activate the mirror neur neurons in the same motor areas as though the monkey was grabbing and lifting up the banana himself. Uh, so the brain immediately recognizes what it would feel like if we were doing the same movement that someone else is doing. And this is also the case for emotions. When we see someone feeling happy or scared, our mirror neurons will fire in the same way as though we were experiencing that emotion ourselves. And that can help explain why automatic empathy occurs. So if empathy is based in the brain and automatic, it stands to reason that it exists because through natural selection, this trait was valuable in some way for, for preserving the species. Ethologists, that is, scientists of the study of animal behavior in their natural environment, believe this is true. Specifically, empathy has been preserved during human evolution because it helps us attain our shared goals. In this way, empathy acts as kind of a social glue, bringing humans together to ensure our mutual survival and well-being. And although humans as a whole have evolved to have at least some capacity for empathy, there are individual differences in trait or dispositional levels of empathy. So I'm going to speak here in generalities based on research, but obviously group differences are, uh, you know, there's usually more variability within groups than between groups, so keep that in mind. Um, but what research looking at group differences has found is that women typically are more empathetic than men. Uh, does that mean there are no highly empathetic men out there? No, of course not. But overall, that tends to be the trend that women are more empathetic. In terms of age, there are some very mixed findings with some people saying that mo the most empathetic age is when we're in middle adulthood, so around our 40s, and we're less empathetic when we're younger or older. However, there's some studies that say that empathy steadily increases as we age. And these mixed findings are probably related to the various ways we can define empathy as I discussed earlier. So certain types of empathy probably vary across age differently, like cognitive empathy, continually increases as we age, but maybe emotional empathy might peak in middle age. 
Uh, another factor, group difference, um, being married rather than single tends to be associated with increased empathy, uh, as is being a parent or even a pet owner. Also, there are some mental health conditions or psychiatric disorders that are less likely to experience empathy, but there are some nuances to this in terms of what type of empathy is generally affected and what subtypes of the disorder are more likely to have deficits in empathy. So in the case of narcissistic personality disorder, the grandiose subtype, the one who think that they are very highly of themselves and tend to be charming and outgoing, tend to experience cognitive empathy. The ability to understand another's thoughts and feelings, but have difficulties with affective empathy, feeling, actually feeling of others, the feeling is of others. And the valuable subtype, the ones that tend to be more introverted with low self-esteem, they don't seem to have any difficulties with empathy based on self-report and behavioral observations. In relation to antisocial personality disorder, again, they experience cognitive empathy. They understand how a person is feeling but they do not show cognitive empathy or empathetic concern. In other, wo other words, they understand, they just don't care. This can be particularly dangerous because people with antisocial personality disorder can actually read others' emotions quite well, which allows them to manipulate others effectively without any guilt or regret afterwards. Finally, autism is often associated with difficulties with empathy too. And this seems to be related more to the lack of empathetic accuracy, as we talked about earlier. They have a hard time reading social cues and body language to determine what other people are thinking and feeling, which makes it a lot harder for them to accurately understand another person's feelings. And this is one reason why it's so important to understand the various processes involved in empathy, because individuals who display difficulties with empathy aren't always callous and unfeeling, as is usually the case with antisocial personality disorder, but sometimes they lack a necessary skill required to effectively understand another person's feelings. So you'll see here a quote from Barack Obama's 2008 electoral campaign that he shared at various other venues, including graduation speeches. Um, I was going to click a link, but I'm not going to bother trying to get that to work right now. Uh, and I'm not going to try and do an impersonation of him because I'll inevitably butcher it. Um, essentially, and of course my, can you make that quote a little bigger on the side so I can see it? If not, that's okay. The slide itself, I can't read it. I'm sure everyone here, I shouldn't say I should, uh, but most likely people can read it. Essentially, it's talking about the empathy deficit if I can't make it bigger in time. Don't worry about it. Essentially, the quote is saying that there is, instead of in the US, you know, a deficit in empathy. So a lack of empathy. People seem to be struggling more than ever with their, oh, hey, thank you. So I'll read the quote. Uh, so there's a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit. But I think we should talk more about the empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to see the world through those who are different from us, the child who's hungry, the laid off steel worker, the immigrant woman cleaning your dorm room. Uh, and I like this quote because it suggests, you know, that empathy is needed. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this presentation. Uh, and it says that people seem to be struggling more than ever with understanding people's thoughts and feelings. And it made me wonder, you know, was this always a case that we had this empathy deficit or is this a new phenomenon? And what we found was a longitudinal cohort study by Conrath and colleagues in 2011 that said that empathy is in fact decreasing. Granted, this is only one study, but the researchers found that effective empathy, again, the emotional sharing and responding to the feelings of others, decreased 48% between 1979 and 2009. And cognitive empathy, understanding a person's perspectives and emotions, have decreased by 34%. Now, this study didn't look into why this might be the case, but there have been some theories why. This include the rise of social media, being more independent and anonymous in larger cities, leading to disconnection from others, and being more focused on our own survival than on community well-being, because human existence has become increasingly more complicated and our communities have grown to be so large.
So I'm hoping we can have a bit of a chat here. Uh, feel free to type your responses into the chat. And what I'm hoping you can comment on is when do you find your empathy is lower than usual? So what are the circumstances? What emotions might be associated with lower empathy? Just type your, your thoughts into the chat, if you will. When, when do you find your empathy is just not quite as good as it could be? Burnout and compassion fatigue, most definitely. And that's definitely going to come up in a moment. Any other thoughts about when you're just not really able to get in touch with other people's feelings as good as you sometimes can? Another minute or so, see if anyone has any other ideas. When you aren't taking care of yourself, self-care is so important, absolutely. And that's definitely on my list of reasons why empathy might be lower, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. Let's see what, what we came up with in terms of reasons. So some of the ideas we came up with when we're low on sleep and when we're hungry, I can definitely um, vouch for that one. I am not the same person. <laughs> Hangry is a real it, thing. It is a real thing. Yeah. Um, but my empathy goes much lower. This is because even though empathy can be an automatic process, it, it takes a fair amount of resources. So if you're already low on resources, your brain has the less capacity to put towards higher cognitive functions like empathy. If we think about engaging in empathy is going to cause us emotional pain that we can't manage at the moment, we're less likely to be empathetic as a way of self-protection. As you might have guessed from discussing emotional, sorry, discussing situational empathy earlier, the situation can also play a huge role. If you are in a highly stressful situation like living through a pandemic, we have less capacity for empathy than if you weren't in the midst of a major stressor. Although we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, as it, it always isn't the case that high stress situations result in lower empathy. Also, if you're interacting, who you're interacting with can play a huge role. Do you like that person? Are they someone you know or are they a stranger? This can impact levels of empathy as well. Research has shown that empathy often breaks down when we are trying to engage with people who are very different from us because it takes a lot more effort to understand their perspective as compared to someone who shares the same view. And of course, throughout what medium are you interacting with the person? I think we can almost all say that we have seen how in interactions online seem to have much, much less likelihood of empathy compared to in-person interactions. So I'm going to throw some psychology terms at you because psychology loves to put big fancy labels on everything. Uh, it's going to further explain how empathy can be affected by situational factors. So the first one you'll see is the hot-cold empathy gap. And that says that it's much harder for us to empathize with a person when we aren't experiencing the same emotion as them. So if we're calm and the other person is angry, we tend to have less empathy for them. Same thing vice versa. If we're angry, we might have a harder time empathizing with someone who's trying to remain calm. We have a hard time remembering what it's like to feel a different emotional state than the one we're currently in. There's also the outgroup empathy gap. It says that we tend to be more likely to empathize with similar people, just as Nicole mentioned, uh, although this tends to occur when people take what's called a self-oriented approach to empathy, as opposed to an other-oriented perspective. So what that means, it's the difference between seeing ourselves in the other person's shoes as a way to understand, so what would it be like if I were in their shoes, versus trying to understand how that person feels in the situation. Self-oriented perspectives can actually decrease empathy because it can lead people to think, well, I wouldn't feel that way if I were in your position, as opposed to other oriented uh, empathy or perspective taking. There hasn't been a lot of research on empathy throughout COVID as compared to pre-COVID, but some indirect evidence that the pandemic has impacted our levels of empathy. First of all, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, people were suddenly thrusted together into a challenging set of circumstances. So we were all in this together, but doing our best to support and understand each other. But as time wore on, stress 
stress levels increased or were maintained at a very high level, taking up necessary resources needed to be empathetic. And as things progressed, people started to realize that others had very different experiences of the pandemic, with some being much hit a much harder than others and some living relatively unaffected, which created additional chances for the hot, cold, and outgroup empathy gaps to come into play. Okay, how about another set of discussion questions? So I want you to picture in your mind someone who's very empathetic, someone who always seems to be able to understand other people's feelings and perspectives. Okay, do you have someone in mind? Okay, so what does this person do that tells you that they're empathetic? How do they interact with other people? How are they emotionally? Just take a moment and really think about that and let me know what your thoughts are in the chat. Might be asking hard questions today. Made in the way that it is. Right, our resources. Our resources are low. Yeah. <laughs> Just someone who you think, wow, that's a really empathetic person. What are they like? What, how do they treat other people? Selfless. Awesome word. Although we'll get into that a little bit more as well. Supportive for sure. Compassionate, absolutely. That behavioral piece of empathy. Validating, compassionate, absolutely. And we'll get more into validation as well as we start talking about how to increase empathy. Put others' needs before their own, absolutely. Although there's a flip side to this that we'll get into as well, but for sure. Thank you for chatting it up with understanding their feelings. Absolutely. So here are some of the features associated with highly empathetic people, like we mentioned in the chat. They tend to be good at listening to what others have to say. Others go to them with their problems. They tend to be highly aware of others, so they notice what is going on with someone without even having to say anything. Um, they tend to be more emotionally regulated, which means they don't tend to lose their control of their emotions easily. They tend to engage in what we call pro-social behavior, helping other people, doing things that make others happy. They tend to have strong, healthy relationships with other people, so their friends, partners, families all get along with them easily. They tend to, to, keep, to be kind and caring towards others. They don't tend to judge others harshly. They tend to be open-minded to others' ways of thinking and doing things that might not be their own way. Now, this does paint a very rosy picture of an empathetic person, but as we will discuss later, there are some downsides to being highly empathetic as well if you're not able to manage it well throughout setting appropriate boundaries. Ah, question, would these people be called empaths? Now, empaths, in a, from a psychological perspective, isn't a term that is regularly used. We would, and even highly sensitive people is a term I've heard thrown around, but in the psychology word, world, it's not, it's not one that we use. Um, it's not a really firm definition of what would define an empath. So um, I think a lot of people would call themselves empaths, but in, in the strictest definition of psychology, I don't think we would use that term. I know for me, when I think of like empaths, it's more of like a spiritual process in like the supernatural kind of spin gotcha. of it. So yes. I know that that's typically not what we're talking about here. Um, but now I want you to think about the opposite. Someone who seems to have little to no empathy. What do they do? How would you know that somebody doesn't have a lot of empathy right now? What are their interactions like? How are they emotionally? And if you want to just pop that in the chat, just like we did last time, that'd be great. Inconsiderateness, absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. 
Sure. Disregard and don't notice how others are feeling. Dead on. Highly sociable but lacking conscience in those interactions. Better yet. That's our last one. Brushy aside. Yeah. Those are great examples, for sure. Good job. And those are interactions that genuinely leave you feeling like you haven't been hurt at all. Not good listeners. Absolutely. You touched on pretty much all of them to some extent. Good job. So people who are dispositionally low in empathy tend to show the opposite behaviors of what we just talked about for those who are high in empathy. So they often rush to judgment. I see trying to push their agenda onto you. Absolutely. So they rush to judgment. They blame other people. They tend to be very critical, which came up. Um, they argue with you even though they don't really care about the topic, so argumentativeness was in there. Uh, their emotions fly off the handle at the drop of a dime. Uh, they tend to have relationship difficulties. They have a hard time maintaining friendships and romantic relationships. And they tend to be self-centered, insecure, and as a result, closed-minded. So based on that thought exercise, you can imagine what type of behaviors are associated with highly em high empathy and low empathy. And based on the research, people who are highly empathetic do tend to engage in more pro-social pro behavior based on the research. Things like making donations, volunteering, other helping behaviors are much higher among empathetic people. And for people with low empathy, they tend to be more aggressive, more likely to commit crime, especially crime where there are victims involved and it is also associated with prejudice, including racism, sexism, homophobia, and others. So there's been research conducted in various populations, including adolescents, nurses, doctors, just the general population, and they found that the relationship between mental health and empathy exists. So specifically, those with higher empathy tend to have lower anxiety, lower depression symptoms, higher well-being, and lower rates of burnout. And being shown empathy is actually associated with decreased loneliness, depression, and anxiety. And actually, there's been some studies that were conducted during the pandemic of people who engaged in an empathetic conversation uh, once or multiple times with complete strangers who were not particularly trained in psychology, and they found that it improved symptoms of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Uh, and going a step further, higher levels of empathy are associated with better client care among nurses, doctors, therapists. Their patients or clients tend to be more satisfied with their services. They're more likely to adhere to treatment, and they tend to have better treatment outcomes as a result, even for things like diabetes that you wouldn't think would be associated with that. Uh, and when the person in charge of their care is empathetic, and in schools, it's similar. So highly empathetic teachers tend to be more well-liked by their students. Their students have greater motivation to learn. Uh, they have higher self-esteem and social skills and less absences and disruptive behaviors. And all of that results in improved school performance overall. But as it was mentioned earlier, there's a flip side to this. Sometimes highly empathetic people can take on too much of others' emotions. They can become drained and stressed by others. For those familiar, this is similar to the concept of compassion fatigue, which we mentioned earlier, where individuals, particularly in the helping profession, tend to take on an excessive amount of emotions and don't place needed boundaries to maintain their own mental health and well-being, resulting in lower mental health despite high levels of empathy. This is common for people who try to suppress or avoid emotions because they don't realize they have taken on too much of others' emotions until it has caused damage to their own mental health. I think a lot of people yeah, shots fired relate, on yeah, feel a little <laughs> attacked, perhaps, yeah. in the helping profession here. Yeah. <laughs> Got another discussion question for you. Do you think empathy is an innate skill? So in other words, something we're born with? Or do you think it's something that can be learned and developed? What do you think? Innate or learned? And just type it into the chat again. Do 
you're unsure of how to answer, it's a bit of a trick question. Innate? Ah, I've got them both. That would be the tricky part of this question. Yeah, the answer is both. My best friend and I actually have a saying, the answer is always both. It's very much based in dialectical behavior therapy, but it seems to be pretty much universally true. The last comment there says both. One definitely has to be wired a certain way to have a greater tendency to be empathetic. I would agree. Natural dis disposition plays a huge role, but all of us can learn to be more empathetic as well. So it's definitely both. We're born with that dispositional level of empathy, but at the same time, it's a skill we can develop. And one can learn it through the right circumstances, for sure. And we're going to talk about that more. You're born with the capability, but you need to be taught ways to demonstrate it. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to do today. So here's another quote. So empathy is a skill like any other human skill. And if you get the chance to practice it, you can get better at it. So the research supports the premise that it is a skill that can be learned. There's lots of research that's been done on empathy training, and it shows that we absolutely can increase people's ability to be empathetic. But how do we do that? Well, the first step is adopting an empathy growth mindset. So that is believing that we have the ability to be empathetic, more empathetic if we choose to practice it. And this increases the chances that we'll put in the work to learn how to be more empathetic. In other words, it increases our empathic effort, a willingness to invest time or energy into feeling empathy. If we think that it's an innate trait that can't be changed, then we're less likely to put in the effort. So there was a study I found by Schumann et al. in 2014, uh, and it showed that a number of different, they did a whole bunch of different studies, and some of the findings were uh, effort to feel empathy when it's challenging was increased when they told people about this empathy growth mindset. So when people believe that it is a skill that can be modified or learned, uh, they were more likely to put in that effort. Uh, they had more empathetic, effortful responses to people with conflicting views on socio-political issues. They spent more time listening to the emotional story of a person from a racial outgroup. Uh, they had greater willingness to help cancer patients in an effortful face-to-face -face ways. And the possible reason for greater empathic effort in challenging contexts uh, is a stronger interest in improving one's empathy, so that growth mindset. So after increasing empathic effort, there are a number of strategies you can use to increase your level of empathy as well. So the first is to show difference between empathy and sympathy and avoid sympathy. So sympathy is where you feel bad for another person and it usually leads to disconnection. Whereas empathy is feeling what the other person is feeling, which leads to greater connection. And then the next way that you become more empathetic is becoming aware of how you think about things and looking for any biases in your thinking. So you can see a list of common unhelpful thinking styles here, or cognitive biases, and people often find they tend to engage in one or a couple of these thinking styles more than others. Uh, one that I often point out in my clients is shooting all over themselves. Uh, so that one comes up a lot with people, but there's also kind of minimizing or mac uh, kind of focusing in on certain things and kind of mentally filtering out other information. Um, there's catastrophizing, thinking that things are going to be worse than they are. Um, so there's a number of ways that our brain has been kind of programmed through evolution to think, but in ways that aren't so accurate or helpful. Or helpful. And once you become more aware of your thoughts and biases in them, you can start to challenge those thoughts. So for example, if you're thinking I have to change their mind in relation to someone who won't get vaccinated, you're certainly not going to feel much empathy for them. But if you recognize that there's some evidence for this thought, some evidence against this thought, and there is more accurate, unbiased thought, then you can increase your chances of empathy. Thinking, I will discuss it with them and see what happens, is a much more empathetic than they're wrong and I have to change their mind. Another strategy is engaging in something called mindfulness. 
So there's a lot of research on mindfulness-based interventions and how they improve empathy in a variety of settings. Mindfulness, it's essentially connecting with the present moment without judgment. And it can be done in a number of different ways. You can do formal meditation practices where you sit down and put on the YouTube script and, and have them guide you through a formal meditation practice. Or you can just bring your attention to everyday tasks intentionally. I love doing it when I'm showering. Feeling the water on my skin, smelling the bubbles, you know, listening to the sound of the water hitting the side of the tub. I have the option of doing a, a quick mindfulness exercise, but I think I'm going to skip over it. Let me just take your time. Next is a skill taken from dialectical behavior therapy called radical acceptance. And as you see in the little pictures here, it is essentially means avoiding labels and judgments and accepting things just as they are. And if you remember, avoiding judgments is the key process in empathy. So as we mentioned earlier, emotion regulation is highly associated with levels of empathy. So how good are we at managing and controlling our emotions? That's because people who struggle to regulate their emotions have a much harder time seeing others' perspectives. That's because the rational part of our brain, the frontal lobes, stop working when we're highly emotional. And the base brain, the animal brain, takes over. So these are, you'll see here on this slide, three skills I teach to almost all of my clients with anxiety or stress in their lives, which is pretty much all of my clients and myself included. Yeah. <laughs> so deep breathing is the first one you see here. Involves taking long, slow breaths from the diaphragm, so right in the, in the pit of your stomach, meaning that you're completely expanding your stomach like a balloon. I have my clients literally just put their hands right here and go. And instead of breathing from your upper chest or shallow breathing, which is. And that's associated with increased tension and anxiety. So if you find you're a shallow breather, you're probably not helping your anxiety or stress out. And if you were here for the end of the last workshop, you may have heard this is one of my go-to relaxation strategies because it's simple. You can do it anywhere. And people don't usually notice that you're doing it. And it's scientifically based because it switches that fight or flight system right off, which really allows you to be more empathetic. The second one you see here is progressive muscle relaxation. So this involves tensing and then releasing each muscle group one by one to relieve muscle tension caused by stress and anxiety. So I might tense my bicep for five seconds, pretend I'm a little strong. Not so much that it hurts or that you're shaking, but that you can feel that tension. And then you let it go for about 10 seconds. And you just feel the difference between the tension in your muscle and then the lack of tension in your muscle. And then you move on to the next muscle, it could be your hands or your back or whichever. And then sometimes you can even say, ah, relax, and take some deep breaths while you do it. And then the last one you'll see is visualization or mental imagery. So it involves picturing yourself somewhere you find relaxing. I go to the beach. A lot of people do. Not everyone's a beach person, but I definitely am. And so when, it's kind of like when people say, go to your happy place. Uh, so when I do this, either, I, either on the beach or I'm picturing myself walking my dog. Sadly, I lost. But on a nice summer day, you know, thinking of listening to the sounds of the beautiful weather, the, the sun shining on my face, the, the sound of my feet hitting the pavement, the fresh cut grass, and really activate my brain in a way that involves all of the senses so that it seems like I'm actually there. Allowing instead of suppressing emotions can help increase our empathy. As we mentioned earlier, this is important because people who do not, do not make space for or acknowledge their emotions tend to end up with compassion fatigue, which results in lower empathy. We can do this by using something called the RAIN practice. So recognizing means paying attention to the emotion. How does it feel in your body? Can you label that feeling? Allowing means not trying to push the feeling away, even though it's uncomfortable. Investigation means to consider where the emotion might be coming from, what factors might be contributing to your feelings. Non-identification means finalizing, or sorry, recognizing that the emotions are temporary and that you exist outside of these feelings. Yeah. 
uh, I find when I do this one with clients, people go, I don't want to experience the bad emotions. I just want to push them away, distract, avoid. And it takes a lot of processing and, and kind of getting into it for them to open up space and kind of allow negative feelings to be there. But it's so important because they're telling us some, to something. They serve a purpose. And, and if you ignore them, then you can find yourself in a situation where you have a lot of negative emotions that aren't being managed. And they just build up and up and up. So if we try and break them down now, we can feel that and move along with them rather than feel it drowning by them. Exactly. And then finally, connecting with others is one of the best ways to increase empathy. Surprise, surprise. Uh, especially if the people we're interacting with are different than us, um, whether that be culturally, socioeconomically, or in some other way. So you can do this through social media. For example, I follow a lot of black and indigenous people on social media uh, to get a sense of what their perspective on world issues are. It's always very enlightening to me. I also follow those with autism and other mental health conditions that I don't experience myself so that I have the under understanding of what their perspectives are on the world. Um, you can also do this through attending community events with different people. So um, I found an example of going to different uh, places of worship or religious places that you typically don't. So if you're Christian, attending a mosque or a Sikh temple, uh, can allow you to be more empathetic to those groups of people. And then um, that also helps to reduce the barriers to empathy, obviously, uh, one of which is dehumanization. So if you don't know anyone of that culture, you're less likely to see them as human and less likely to have empathy for them. And the final point I have here is uh, reading has actually been shown to increase empathy because it allows you to learn about other people's perspectives and worldviews, and you can do it in a safe and enjoyable manner. A final discussion question. Can we influence others' empathy? Given that's in the agenda and we said we will talk about how to do this, you might suspect that we can, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So if you just want to put those right in the chat, that'd be great. I'll give you a couple minutes to think on it. We may have given too much away. I, I think we might. <laughs> Definitely, although it's easier to destroy empathy, it can be built back up again in healthy levels as well. I believe it depends on who they are, their personality. Makes sense, definitely. All right, and as I said before, the answer is always both, always. So we can, oh. Yes, if they're open-minded and will allow it to resonate with them, for sure. So it's both. We can encourage empathy in others, just like you said, but they have to want to learn as well. Uh, I often have this conversation with clients where I say, uh, talking about effective communication skills, and it doesn't guarantee that the person will do what we want or treat us fairly or anything else. Same is true for empathy. We can do things that will increase the likelihood that others will show empathy, but we can't make them do it if they have no intention of doing so. So assuming the person you are interacting with shows some indication of willingness to interact in a positive way, you can start encouraging empathy by displaying it yourself. This shows the person how to engage with you and sets the stage for empathetic interactions. And when you are empathetic towards someone, they are more likely to be empathetic back to you. So it increases the likelihood of reciprocity. And when we are being empathetic, the person is likely less likely to get defensive and react emotionally, as we talked about earlier, keeping emotions calm increased the capacity for empathy. So another way to encourage empathy in others is to use assertiveness skills to communicate as effectively as possible. So what you see here is a set of strategies from dialectical behavior therapy, specifically the interpersonal effectiveness module, which focuses on how to do what works in your relationships with other people. So they highlight the steps in attaining the three goals of interpersonal effectiveness. Uh, so the first one you'll see there is dear man, and that's getting what you want. Um, so you describe the situation objectively, 
stick to the facts, avoid opinions and interpretations, uh, get everyone on the same page. E stands for express, let others know how a situation makes you feel by clearly expressing your feelings. Don't expect people to read your minds. People are not mind readers as much as we'd like them to be. Uh, try using the I feel type statements. So I feel when you, I feel because. Uh, be assertive. So don't beat around the bush. Say what you need to say. Don't say, oh, well, I don't know if I can cook tonight or not. Say, I won't be able to cook tonight. I'm working late. Reinforce. So reward people who respond well. Reinforce your desired outcome if it's positive. So if someone says, oh, I'm, I, something that you like, you can be as simple as a smile or a thank you. You don't have to go out and buy them a gift every time. Being mindful, we talked a bit about this already, but don't forget the objective of your interaction. So it can be easy to get sidetracked into harmful arguments, lose focus. Um, just try to maintain this topic of conversation and not get sidetracked by perhaps past arguments that tend to come up. The A is for appear confident. Consider your posture, your tone, your eye contact, your body language, because as we've talked about, that really sets the tone for the interaction are reading those cues and then n is negotiate so you can't have everything you want in every circumstance in every conversation in every interaction so be open to a reasonable level of negotiation um, if you wash the dishes I'll put them away okay. so the second one is give that's the goal in, with this acronym is maintaining the relationship so the G stands for gentle don't attack don't threaten don't express judgment during your interactions. Accept the occasional no for your requests. Act interested. And you don't actually have to be interested. You have to act interested. Uh, so don't interrupt the other person. Put your phone away. Turn the TV off. This will come up again later as well. Validate. So outwardly validate the other person's thoughts and feelings. You don't have to agree with them. You just have to acknowledge what they are and recognize their opinion and respect it. And then have an easy manner. So an easy attitude, try to smile, act lighthearted. And then the last one is maintaining your self-respect. The acronym there is FAST. So fair, be fair, not only to others, but also to yourself. I'm going to run out of my ability to see this, and I don't know if I can scroll down, but uh, A is don't overly apologize if I'm not mistaken. Apologize only when appropriate. Uh, some of us have a tendency to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, and you really did nothing wrong. So avoid that to maintain your self-respect. Uh, stick to your values. So if you value kindness, try to exude that. Uh, don't you know, start behaving in a way that is against your values simply because it's a difficult interaction. And then be truthful. Don't uh, start saying things that aren't true just to get it out of the interaction. That would really compromise your self-respect. So along with communicating effectively, listening effectively is also important for encouraging empathy. You listen effectively using something called active listening, which means treating listening as an active process rather than a passive one. This means participating in the conversation rather than acting as an audience. Active listeners show their listening by putting away distractions. Stop watching TV, using your phone, or doing other things while listening sending, sends the message that the speaker's words are not important. Putting away distractions allows you to focus on the conversation and help the speaker feel heard. Use verbal and nonverbal communication, body language, and short verbal cues that match the speaker's affect, so including responding in an exciting way if the speaker is excited to. Show interest and empathy. Verbal, mm-hmm, that's interesting and that makes sense. I understand or nonverbal, or as important as well as nonverbal, nodding in agreement, reacting to emotional contact, smiling or eye contact. Active listeners also encourage sharing by asking open-ended questions. These questions encourage elaboration rather than just a yes or no response. Open-ended questions tell the speaker that you're listening and you want to learn more. What's it like? How do you feel when? Can you tell me more about that? What do you like about that? What are your thoughts about that? Use reflections. In your own words, summarize the speaker's most important points. 
be sure to include emotional content, even if it was something that you just picked up on through tone or body language. I've been having a hard time at work. There's way too much to do and I can't keep up. My boss is frustrated that everything isn't done and I can't help it. The listener might pick up on, it sounds like you're doing the best you can to keep up, but there's too much work and that sounds stressful. Finally, active listeners strive to understand. Be present. Listening means paying attention to body language, tone, and verbal content. Focus your attention on listening instead of other mental distractions, such as what you want to say next. When people save sensitive conversations for quiet time with few distractions, listen with an open mind. Your job is to understand the speaker's point of view, even if you don't agree. Avoid for forming opinions and making judgments until you fully understand their perspective. So the same way that we build empathy in ourselves and encourage em empathy in others, we can teach our children to be more empathetic. It's very important. So parents in schools both play a role, as do anyone involved in caregiving or regularly interacting with kids. So we can model empathy so children can see how to use these skills themselves. We can teach them about feelings, how to identify them in themselves using things like physical sensations in their own body or tone and body language from others. Also, we can teach them those interpersonal assertiveness skills we just talked about. Uh, and actually, when I teach those skills to clients, especially in groups, they usually say, wow, this would have been really helpful to learn earlier, uh, maybe in elementary school. It would have made my life so much easier. So we need to ensure we're doing better for the children in our lives than many of us perhaps were. Also, teaching them how to regulate their emotions through things like relaxation strategies, um, just like we talked about. Uh, so that they're not in that heightened state of physiological arousal that interferes with empathy by shutting off our frontal lobes. And then encouraging them to interact with people who are different from us. So whether that be through reading, social media, or in-person interaction, ensuring they have connections with a wide variety of people can help increase their empathy. And so, you know, for all the parents out there, one model of parenting that heavily relies on using empathy skills with your children is called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. It's by Ross Green, acronym CPS. And I mention it because it's a model of parenting that is very collaborative, it involves collaborative discussions. And you find out what the child's concerns are, what the parent's concerns are, and you work together to find a solution that addresses everyone's concerns. It's a little bit different than the kind of behavior management that's typically used where there's punishment consequences and rewards if you do something right. It's more collaborative and kind of encourages empathy instead of rote kind of behavior, uh, uh, just kind of doing what you're told. So it's a method that directly teaches skills like problem solving and empathy and has a lot of accessible resources for parents. Uh, it assumes that kids do well if they can, which I really like. Mm -hmm. And of course, teaching all of these skills to our children can be hard because a lot of us have to learn these skills ourselves, right? Uh, and if you don't know how to do it yourself, it's a lot harder to teach your children. So in order to support our kids, <coughs> excuse me, we also need to learn these skills ourselves. And for those of us who are in the role that allow it, teaching others about empathy, why it's important and it's malleable and not fixed, and then teaching them the skills needed to be empathetic, like we're doing now, is really important. But it doesn't have to be a mental health professional teaching the public. It can be managers holding a presentation at work. It can be politicians highlighting it for the country like Barack Obama did, and any number of settings and ways to get the message out. And this is important because there are, are many misconceptions about empathy, like it can't be increased because it's dispositional and we are born with a certain level and that's it. And if we dispel these myths, research show that we can increase empathetic effort in those who can learn this information. So to wrap up, we have some of more accessible resources. So I didn't give you any peer-reviewed journal articles. I don't even think I want to read them at the end of my doctorate anymore, so I'm not going to make you. Um, so some accessible resources that I used in the, that were used in the making of this presentation. Uh, so a couple of videos, one explaining empathy and the importance of it. Uh, there's a podcast called Speaking of Psychology that's uh, available through the 
think it's the American Psychological Association, that mentions empathy and its relationship to narcissistic personality disorder. And then there's a few articles about empathy, the issues with it, cultivating it, and teaching it to children uh, for parents and teachers. So thank you everyone for listening and engaging in the workshop. We've left some time for questions, so feel free to ask and we'll be happy to answer them now. Usually we sit quietly and awkwardly for a little while, and if we don't hear anything in a few minutes, then we let you all go. So feel free to take your time. Give everybody a couple minutes. I know earlier someone asked if there would be a replay sent out, and usually we send out a recording and all of those resources that I mentioned. So. Oh, wonderful. So yeah, apparently you'll get the resources ahead of time. When does empathy become codependency? That's a good question. Very good question. Or can it? I would argue that it is very much based on boundary setting. So if you have a tendency to be so empathetic and then you kind of uh, don't set those intentional boundaries, maybe you sacrifice your own self-respect, um, that's when you kind of end up relying on a person. And I mean, codependency is more about the interaction of being heavily reliant on each other and not being able to kind of in disentangle from the other person. So if both people are highly empathetic, um, that, that is, I think, a possibility. Um, but I would say as long as both people kind of maintain some level of boundaries uh, and are aware of their tendency to be over empathetic towards their partner and perhaps not consider themselves as much, uh, then you can avoid that. But yeah, I think empathy could be involved in codependency, although it's not necessarily the entire picture. And the risk with that is then people become burnt out, right? Like we talked about at the beginning and then their level of empathy goes down. So it's really important that those boundaries are put in place and people have that self-awareness of, of really doing that body scan about what's going on with themselves. What is the likelihood of highly sensitive, empathetic children to develop adverse mental health problems in adolescence? How can this be addressed at an early age? So you're thinking very empathetic children who don't have those boundaries that we're talking about and have a tendency to take on all of the world's problems, carry the world on their shoulders. And how that relates to mental health problems in adolescence, absolutely. They be can become very anxious, very worried about everything around them. Uh, they can develop depression, for sure. Um, and how do you address that as, at an early age? It is very much about practicing those assertiveness skills and those boundary setting skills. Um, so teaching them that it's not rude to not worry about everyone in their lives, right? Just because you feel that empathy doesn't mean you need to act on it at all times. Um, so teaching a little bit about the components of empathy and saying, you know, just because you feel what the other person is feeling doesn't mean that you have to have that behavioral component. Um, you can make sure that you're setting boundaries. And then like you were saying, being aware of their own emotions and emotional capacity. So teaching them to know when they're feeling emotionally overwhelmed and start to engage in those self-care activities to make sure that they don't go too far with their anxiety or depression related to the, that high level of empathy. And recognizing when it's unhealthy. Is codependency linked to enmeshment? Now I've heard this word. I'm not as familiar with it as I probably could be. Do you know offhand either? Enmeshment. Um, the way that I've ever um, talked about it is when people have the inability to distangle themselves, right? So then they take on the kind of persona, the, the stereotypes that the other person has, the 
just the inability to really have their own identity um, is basically what enmeshment meant with, with me and my work that I've done. Um, so it, to me, it was a progression, like a spectrum. So they start to get really entangled, that codependency becomes there, but then they, it gets so extreme that there isn't the identity of two people anymore. They're very dependent upon one another for everything. Um, so that is when those boundaries are very critical, those healthy limit setting, that healthy um, communication and listening skills, and that scan of your body to understand, like, where are you taking on this stress from someone else? Um, but really understanding that there has to be a healthy difference between the two people um, and seeking support in order to make sure that that happens. Um, so to me, in my personal opinion, I'm not definitely... A, a psychiatrist or anything like that but to me there is a fine line between codependency and enmeshment and it just depends on how severe that bond is and how difficult it would be to disentangle those two people that makes perfect sense to me I would have thought there was more overlap but I can definitely see how that could be part of the spectrum for sure so yeah definitely highly linked mm -hmm. You guys are all very much highlighting the kind of the, the potential downsides of empathy when it's when it goes unchecked. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Thank you. If there's any other questions, I'll give maybe another minute or two, and then we can all log off. minute or two when you're staring at a screen seems like an age. <laughs> <laughs> Ages. In, in all of my defense, it took me probably three quarters of the way to see the time. I'm like, not sure it was there the whole time. Yeah, I was like, how do you know how long the minute has been? You're yeah. just guessing? Yeah. Just magic. Yeah. <laughs> Very God, strong God. internal clock. Yeah, I was like, holy moly. And then I was like, oh, look at that. That's right. <laughs> yeah. there. So waiting for new contracts. Oh, that so, doesn't help. I don't know, I was like, is that numbers? Those are numbers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tricky. I'm lucky enough to have perfect vision. Really? At age Tricky. 35. That's yeah. awesome. Knock on wood. <laughs> but I've had contracts since I was like 15, so it's kind of, I'm used to it now. Yeah, yeah. I can tell when I need new ones because I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank sure. you for these. Or are those zeros? Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, instead of everyone listening to us chit chat, <laughs> maybe we'll let everybody go. Again, thank you for joining us. Much appreciate everyone interacting. It makes our time here together a lot better. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.